26-year-old Wanda Jean Mays lived in Huntsville, Alabama, and worked as a secretary at the United States Army's Redstone Arsenal. She was an active member of her church and was very close with her family. Those who knew her described her as quiet but very kind. Wanda did suffer from what her family describes as a chemical imbalance that required the care of a doctor. She suffered from very sporadic but very intense panic attacks. For the most part, people outside of her family, including her roommate, did not even realize that she was struggling with this issue. However, in May of 1986, her mental health began deteriorating. Her father attributed the decline to Wanda's decision to begin dieting. On May 11, 1986, Wanda had dinner with her parents. On her way back to Huntsville, she stopped at the lakeside home of her aunt and uncle, Betty and Ty Dorman, in the Warrington community just outside of Guntersville. They convinced her to spend the night with them, promising to make sure to wake her early enough for her to get to work on time. At 5 a.m. on May 12th, Betty went to Wanda's room to wake her. The door was locked, and there was no answer from Wanda when Betty called out to her. Betty and Ty could not get the door open. They had to have their grandson break it down in order to get into the room. The double-paned window in the bedroom had been broken from the inside, despite no one in the house hearing it shatter during the night. The bed had not been slept in, and Wanda's clothes were neatly folded on the nightstand. On the dock on the lake behind the house, the family discovered Wanda's torn and bloodied nightgown. Fearing that Wanda may have drowned, search divers were deployed in the lake, which was also dragged. The effort did not find Wanda, but did come across a canoe floating in the lake with more blood inside of it. The blood type was consistent with Wanda's. Witnesses came forward with two potential sightings of Wanda shortly after she went missing. A witness claimed to have seen a woman matching Wanda's description walking along Alabama State Route 62, wearing oversized clothing and with wet hair. Another witness claimed to see a woman who looked like Wanda in the backseat of a car in the parking lot of a convenience store in Huntsville. The woman was with two men and appeared to be afraid of them. When the witness came out of the store a short time later, the woman was talking on a payphone with one of the men standing with her. Despite the extensive search and leads from witnesses, Wanda's disappearance would remain unsolved for almost 22 years. On January 23, 2008, Marshall County Sheriff Scott Walls announced that Wanda's remains had been located and identified. In 2003, a hunter had come across skeletal remains in a remote part of Georgia Mountain off of Cha La Key Road in Guntersville, 1.8 miles from Betty and Ty Dorman's home. The remains were examined by both the FBI and the University of Tennessee's Department of Forensic Anthropology to conclusively identify them as Wanda and determine her cause of death. According to the examination, Wanda died after falling 150 feet from the cliff her remains were discovered below. The sheriff's office ruled her death an accident and announced that there were no indications of foul play. As best as they can determine, Wanda had a panic attack while at her aunt and uncle's home. It was intense enough that she broke through the window and went running out into the night, taking the canoe across a small portion of the lake before continuing to run. In the dark, she was unable to see the cliff and ran off of it on accident. Wanda's family accepts the sheriff's office account of what happened to Wanda. After more than two decades, they finally were able to give her a proper memorial service and burial. In February 2002, Lee and Brenda Heist of Lidditz, Pennsylvania, were in the middle of a divorce. While Brenda had a job as a bookkeeper at a car dealership, she had not yet found a new place to live. She dropped off her 12-year-old son and 8-year-old daughter at school on February 8th, but was not home when they finished school. The children called their father at work, but he was not immediately concerned, assuming that Brenda was simply running late getting home. He had plans to go to a birthday party for his mother directly from work, but went home when his children called after dark, saying their mother was still not home. Seeing nothing unusual at the house, Lee decided to wait until 8 o'clock to see if Brenda would come home. When she failed to, he called the police. 
Brenda's car was found in a nearby town four days later. It was parked near a bus station, but there were no records of Brenda buying a ticket there or at any other bus station or airport. An investigation was conducted by local, state, and federal authorities, but none of them uncovered solid leads to follow. Dozens of potential witnesses were interviewed. Lee Heist was considered a suspect in Brenda's disappearance due to their marriage falling apart, but he was eventually cleared. In 2010, he petitioned the Lancaster County Courts to have Brenda declared legally dead so that his children could have some closure. On April 27, 2013, a woman walked into a police station in Key Largo, Florida. She said that she believed a warrant was out for her arrest for a probation violation in another county. While she was known to Florida law enforcement as Kelsey Smith, she told police that her real name was Brenda Heist. According to Brenda, on the morning of February 8, 2002, she had gone to a park after dropping off her children at school. While she had a job, her income was not enough to afford an apartment on her own. She had applied for financial assistance so that she and her children would have a place to live outside of the home her husband was getting in the divorce. She had just learned that her application had been denied. She sat in the park crying and was approached by two men and a woman who asked her what was wrong. They told her that they were about to hitchhike down to Florida. Brenda made a split-second decision to abandon her life and go with them. Brenda originally claimed to have been homeless for most of her 11 years in Florida, but that proved untrue. She had lived in a camper with a boyfriend for several years, working manual labor jobs that paid cash and did not require workers to provide identification. She eventually began cleaning houses and lived for almost a year in the home of one of her clients. While she was living there, she stole her employer's driver's license. She used that license at a traffic stop in February 2013, which led to an identity theft charge. This was a violation of her probation, which she was on for previous marijuana charges and traffic violations. It was this violation that led her to report to the police in April. She said that she finally decided to come clean about her identity because of her deteriorating health. Brenda's children were initially shocked to learn that their mother was alive, but that shock quickly turned to anger. After more than a decade of believing their mother was dead, they were understandably upset to learn that she had simply abandoned them. They did not wish to see her. At the time Brenda resurfaced, her daughter Morgan was attending college and working three jobs, and her son Lee had recently graduated college and was applying to the police academy. Brenda's ex-husband Lee had remarried and moved away from the home he had once shared with Brenda. Brenda was sentenced to one year in prison for her probation violation, but only served six months of that sentence due to good behavior and her participation in a work program. Brenda was released from the Santa Rosa County Jail on November 19, 2013, the day after her 54th birthday. She moved to Texas to stay with her mother and look into options for mental health treatment. Crystal Leanne Anzaldi was born on October 10, 1989, in Hillsboro, Oregon, the second child of Dorothy and Jeff Anzaldi. When Jeff joined the Navy, the family relocated to San Diego, California. Without a lot of money, they eventually moved into the first floor of a house in the Golden Hill neighborhood. A friend of Dorothy's had told her that the house's owner was going into a rehabilitation center and needed someone to stay in the house to take care of it and watch after their three children. The family, lured by the promise of free rent, took the owner up on the offer, only later learning that he was going to prison and not rehab, and that the home had a reputation as a drug house. Six weeks after the family moved into the house, on December 8, 1990, Jeff woke up in the bed the entire family shared at 7 a.m. and covered 14-month-old Crystal with a blanket. He then went back to sleep, when he woke up again an hour later, Crystal was no longer with him. The front door of the house, as well as a door to an upstairs apartment, were wide open. Crystal was nowhere to be found, and the police were called. The entire neighborhood was searched, and helicopters flew overhead announcing that a child was missing, but no sign of Crystal was found. In March of 1997, Marshal Chamblin Rosado of Puerto Rico 
called authorities to report that his wife had been abusing and neglecting his stepdaughter Sonia. During the investigation into the allegations, authorities asked his wife, Nilsa Girabolini Guzman, for her daughter's birth certificate. The document she provided was fraudulent. Sonia was placed in foster care, and in October, a blood test confirmed that she was not Girabolini Guzman's daughter. Investigators turned to Interpol to help determine where Sonia had come from. Comparing her smile and a facial birthmark to photos of missing children, they realized that their Sonia was really Crystal Anzaldi. It is unknown exactly how Guillermo Guzman came to have Crystal. That is, if she herself abducted her, or if there is another party involved. She did not know the Anzaldis, but did know people who were known to visit their house. She claims a friend had given her Crystal, telling her that the child's mother had died. She also said that she hadn't watched the news around the time she got the baby, or learned that an area child was missing. She was married at the time to another man in the Navy, who had been deployed abroad for some time. When he returned home in December 1990, his wife had a baby she claimed was her own, but she would not explain who the child's father was. Inferring that it was not him, he told her to go back to her native Puerto Rico, and he filed for divorce. Guillermo Guzman and Crystal flew to Puerto Rico on December 21st, 1990. Guillermo Guzman was only ever convicted of fraud for the fake birth certificate she provided to police. During the almost eight years their daughter had been missing, Dorothy and Jeff Anzaldi had divorced. Dorothy was living in California, and Jeff was back in Oregon with their older daughter Kendra, as well as his second wife and their daughter. The divorce meant that Crystal could not simply be returned home. The matter of her custody had to be settled first, and involved courts and agencies in both California and Puerto Rico. Jeff was ultimately awarded custody, and Crystal was brought to Oregon to live with him in February 1998. Crystal had a difficult time adjusting to life back in the United States, hoarding and hiding food because she was used to going without it, struggling in school because she was used to speaking Spanish, and having difficulty responding to the name Crystal rather than Sonia. As an adult, she made the conscious decision to try to forget her time in Puerto Rico. As of 2013, she was working as a caregiver in a retirement home. <laughs>